All right, hello. Today we're talking about the uh, Soviet O-11, a uh, interesting little piece of uh, World War II history where they tried to make a mask better, but they couldn't use it because reportedly uh, the average Soviet soldier could not comprehend the uh, usage of straps. That or the increased manufacturing difficulty of doing something that every other country in the entire fucking world did was incredibly expensive and confusing for them. Essentially a, t a one step forward, two steps back sort of deal. Which is really kind of tragic because this is honestly, even though it's technically not a Shlom Mosque anymore because it doesn't have the skull cap, this is arguably one of the best skull cap designs ever made. <laughs> and one of the best Shlom Mosque designs ever made. It's also one of the few cases where the Russians have engineered a surprisingly competent head harness system where you have masks like the... Uh, the I just found that all Soviet masks from the World War II era that have head harnesses are typically pretty okay, but you get post-war, then everything starts going to shit, like with the, the GP4 series, the MM1, the and especially the PMK later in the 80s. So this is like, they had it made with this. This would, this would have been fine, but then it totally fucked up their timeline of development because they kept sticking with Schlemmy boys, so they just completely, for, it's like they forgot how to make a head harness, because they had a pretty good start with this. Anyway, on to the general technical details of it. Um, again, it bears a strong re resemblance to most uh, Shlom Moskas of the period. Obviously, the mechanism's normal, hose is normal. The filter's a little bit weird. I believe it's called a T4. Uh, if I'm wrong on that, I'll post a correction in the uh, uh, description of this video. Uh, again, you can maybe see that the Tizot... Tizot tubes are not integrated. We'll get a better view of that in a moment. Yeah, we'll we're about to take, we'll take it off the head. Uh, the bag is representative. And we, this, this set did not originally come with a carrier, I am told. This is from Moulage's black, quote-unquote, GP4. You can check out that review. Yeah. Um, but um, I, I just figured it was a good placeholder since it's very similar to the pattern of the World War II bags. And in fact, it might be a recycled one, in all honesty, because it yeah. does share a lot of military-esque hardware. Uh, just materials and patterns, so I figure it would be a good placeholder. Yeah, and it's fairly basic. I mean, you have your big fucking... It's kind of like the M1 carrier we covered yesterday. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to... Except we won't be uploading that review until later. So oh, whatever. Idea. Yeah, you'll see it later. It's missing the plug for the bottom of the canister, and you can see the large sort of metal tube or spring inside that leads to the canister inlet, and it would uh, circulate outwards, whereas... Um, yeah, I think that's typically the way they do it on most World War II cancers. The air coming in through the center bottom area would circulate outwards towards the the threads or the hose shank towards the top. And in this case, being a Russian mask, it has filter threads, which are undeniably gossed. Um, the hose is, again, pretty typical of ferrets, but you'd see on even later Soviet masks. The main key thing here is that the threads and all the metal hardware is painted this weird dark bluish gray color. It's fairly common. Yeah, it's... I think that's they, they pretty much only did that on experimental masks, really. No, I've seen standard SM1s that have it. Hmm. I always thought it was like green on uh, SHM1s. No, I, I've seen I've seen several examples that have that light blue color. It's, interesting. It's kind of whatever they had. Um, and then now uh, let me remove the hose from the face piece here. And the interesting thing is that this can actually move, whereas most modern Soviet hoses it actually takes it. Those are usually stuck in place. Well, the rubber gasket's probably gone. Yeah, well, it's not like, it's just the end of the hose and the glue, but, you know, you know yeah, probably yeah. you're right. Um, turn it around to get a better look at the harness, and as you can see, it only has two adjustment points, which is a bit peculiar, but they've engineered it in a way so that you really only need two adjustment points because the the buckles act upon the rest of the straps where it cinches them, as you can see, closer together and tugs on the various points. Of course, I would, I could... See where they would need a wider degree of adjustment because this would only get you so far with various head sizes. And despite being very competent and easy to use, I still have wonders why they would reject this because this is pretty much one of the simpler head harnesses I've ever seen. Like, even a, a British World War II general civilian respirator, which is a cheap pile of dog shit, that only had uh, that had three straps, uh, three adjustment points. But this is a six-point harness, and it had, only has two adjustment points. And before we um, move on to the interior, let's show off the markings on the face piece. Okay, let me get these strips out real quick. Yeah, I probably should. I can't let them run those for you. Okay. 
Okay, so here we have a number two for a size marking. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we yeah, also have that over on here. There's a, there's a stamp somewhere. Ah, yeah. uh, yes, you have the uh, mold number, uh, which is a number 12, fairly early. Is that picking up? There it is. Yep. So that is a very early mold. Um, given that this is an experimental mask, it is not really that um, surprising. I better look at the uh, valve assembly, which is akin to the early 1941 pattern SHM1s. Um, as you can see, there is, or you probably cannot see, there is markings inside of that, uh, on the outlet valve, in which of, of which there is only one, unlike the later SHM41M and SHM62s. The which, later models added that yeah, exterior mud guard. Yeah. Uh, the inside here, we have more markings. Um, obviously, I don't really particularly know what they are. Probably just serial stamps and inspections. Yeah. And then here you can see, as standard with uh, SM1 masks, you okay. have your two uh, Tizzo tubes made of this nice uh, black rubber, which is a lot less flexible. I think it's the same rubber as the hose, would you say? Yeah, about the same. And that's probably the reason why they didn't make black rubber masks until later, is because they really just couldn't figure out how to make black rubber without it being stiff. And they figure that it's better to have this soft white rubber where it's more flexible and would conform to the facial um, extremities rather than have a, a stiff face piece, which would only fit a select few people. Yeah. That said, uh, all of this is really good quality rubber. It's still very flexible, and I, th I think it's actually better than U.S. service masks from the same time period. It's pretty much on par. The molding is leaves a little bit to be desired since there's plenty of flashes, but I'd say in terms of quality, it's about on par with what the West had at the time, like with the M2 service mask. And um, it's sort of like a weird... If I had to make some sort of design analysis, which isn't really based on anything, I'd say it's like a comparable transition somewhere between the M2 service mask and the M1 service mask, because it's it doesn't need stockinette, but it has a very similar um, design, like valve layout configuration to the M1 series, where it has separately attached deflectors and whatnot, but I'm probably just rambling here. No, that makes sense. It works basically like an angle tube. Yeah. Except it's somewhat better, because it, instead of die casting, it's all stamped steel. Yeah, I kind of actually like this one more, honestly. I, I, I'd ironically take this over the uh, M1. Yeah, I, I could agree why. I mean, especially considering the fact that you have a threaded uh, inlet, which allows you to uh, easily break down a, a good 70% of the mask, whereas the M1 service mask being all wired and taped together is pretty much impossible outside of a technical level. That and this, unlike the M1, you can, until you get into the M1, was it the, did the A1 have threaded lenses? The A1 had threaded lenses, the A2 introduced the universal size and changed yeah, the configuration yeah. of the harness. But unlike a, sta you know, like a classic M1, you can actually replace the lenses on these without having a fucking technical degree from WC Gear School of Fuck, <laughs> so. But, yeah, I'm... It's it's the most amazing thing to me is the fact that they were able to pull off the uh, the integrate the buckles into the rubber like this it's competently too very very competently. There's plenty of flashes, but that's to be expected with this type of molding. And even like Western esque countries that do this sort of molding technique have tons of flashes. Um, but anyhow, really not much else to say about it. It's a very good design. And uh, actually, there one thing that I just noticed. Um, so. In my black GP4 review, I mentioned that there's two types of buckles on GP4. This matches the earlier style found on the black one. The only problem being is that this is basically exposed wire, and it can eat right through that. But that's yeah. a problem that we're having now, not back then. Back yeah. then, it really wasn't an issue. And even given that fact, it still held up very well, and this isn't showing any signs of tearing through, as yeah. far as I can tell. Yeah, no, it's, it's a very healthy mask. You can also tell where the... Uh, got the anti-fog insert it's very similar to later shm1 and even like modern shm62 move, move your hands so they can see it's that little metal ring right there yeah i'm sure anyone who's handled a gp5 i'm sure there's about five million of you right now um it's pretty much the same system yeah so it's again it's, it's very good it's still basically a refinement of the sm1 it's one that really should have been more of a thing but wasn't which yeah. is unfortunate the other interesting thing to note here is that notice on the eyepiece crimps, there is no fabric tape underneath, as was the standard later with Soviet masks, where I think they were trying to more closely emulate the M2 service mask with uh, the fact that it did not have any crimps on the American eyepieces. I mean, did, the American eyepieces did not have any 
tape underneath the crimps. Uh, and I assume that's what they start off with. And then they realize, oh, the, the, the crimps are going to eat through the rubber over time. And so they sort of predicted that. But it didn't really do it here. So it's, all, it's held up very well, obviously. And obviously any American masks don't do that either. But it's just a thing to consider, I guess. Um, that's really all there is to say. I'll put this back on the head and we can wrap up the review. Yeah, I think that everything. So, uh, yeah, I, I would be interested to know if this had a specific carrier outside of what we showed. Uh, if, if that carrier that we have is actually a World War II pattern, please correct us or let us know if it's not. Um, and that's pretty much all there is to say. Let us know about the designation of this canister. I don't have it on the top of my head, and I'm sure... It, it's in my notes. Yeah, it's in his notes. I'm sure we'll update the description. I personally believe it looks really similar to the later uh, MO4 canisters or whatever they're called. Um, but anyhow, that's about it. Um, if you have any comments, questions, corrections, or concerns, drop them down in the comments below. And if you want any notes, uh, Moulash. Uh, no, that's really it. Thanks for watching. Um, if you're uh, watching this just as it's published, we're going to do a couple more videos today on my channel and his. So uh, stick around. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we'll see you all later. Yeah. Bye.